Lord, I choose to by your word, for as I dwell and walk in your presence, I shall not lack. Poverty be far from me and my household in Jesus' name. I will walk in your blessings, Lord. I will rise above all that hell has to offer and accept heaven's best here on earth. Everything I set my hands to will prosper because I make you my dwelling place. You are my refuge and my fortress. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. I accept it by faith, fully expecting your blessings in every area of my life. For wherever your presence is, there is no lack. Therefore, Lord, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for abundant harvest, health, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, scholarships and grants, inventions with royalties, finding money, bills paid off, bills decrease, blessings and increase, bargains and child support. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah and amen. The Lord gave me this message early in the week, so I've had a lot of time to think about it. And uh, it's something that I think about frequently anyway. And uh, in fact, I mentioned it throughout the, the year and have for a long time. And uh, I will say this, this will probably be the last four-letter word Sunday since it's the last Sunday of 2023. And that'll make my wife happy, you know, because she's, she's, she's like ready for a change whether anybody else was or not. That just kind of made it simple for Brother Dale. But our four-letter word today is, is the word time. And there's a verse scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to go there in a few minutes. But... Um, the word time, when you look that up in the Greek, which is what our New Testament was written in, the Greek word for that is spelled K-A-I-R-O-S or kairos, and it means opportunity. So when the Bible says redeeming the time, what Paul was saying to the church at Ephesus, what he's saying to us today, what I'm going to speak to you, is that when, we, when I say that we're re, we need to redeem the time, what I'm saying is we need to be redeeming the opportunities that we have. Because generally speaking, when an opportunity is gone, it's gone. Now, you know, 2023 is going to be gone. We're never going to live 2023 again. So this, the time, this time is going to have been gone. We accomplished what we did. We, we did or failed to do what, whatever it was. But that time is over. In Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 3, some of the most familiar scripture in the whole world is where Solomon wrote about time in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, nine, I believe it is, to everything. They, uh, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. That's verses 1 through 8. I'm not sure why he had verse 11 there, but it's okay. He had made everything beautiful in his time. God has. That tells you something about God, doesn't it? Now, we don't see everything beautiful anymore, but the important thing there is that we recognize the importance of the word time itself. 29 times in those nine scriptures, Solomon used the example of time. Now you've heard me say, most of you probably more than once, is that the thing that's most important to us is the thing that has absolutely no importance to God. God is an eternal being, and so time means nothing to him. And yet you guys already know time's almost everything to us. We get everything that regulates our life has to do with a clock. And uh, people come to my house, on every wall there is a clock. I, I like clocks, you know. Um, and I, I still wear watches. Very few people do that anymore. But yet I understand the importance of the time. And what, what Solomon's trying to get across to us here, and something that I've preached a lot in times past, is that there is a time slot for everything. In case you haven't figured that out yet. 
So I'm going to remind you of that. Some of you probably haven't been here and you never heard that before. But you know what? There's a time to go to sleep. That's what he's saying. There's a time to sleep, time to wake, time to work, time to eat, time to talk to your kids, time to uh, read your Bible. There's a time to study the Word. There's a time set aside for church, for you to assemble yourselves together. There's a time uh, of everything that there is. There is a time for it, which means that in a 24-hour day, seven-day week, 365-day year, that God has already allotted. 2024 is coming, and the time's already been allotted to every one of us for everything that we need to accomplish in next year. You know, one of our biggest excuses that come out of our mouth is, well, I don't have time. I don't have time. Uh, When I get time, another time. We use that word consistently, constantly throughout the year. All of us do. And a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, it's like, well, I need to buy some time or I need to make some time. Think about it just for a minute because, uh, again, it, the time's already there. If you haven't figured it out yet, you can't buy time and you really can't make time because the time's already going. The watch has not stopped moving. The second hand keeps, keeps uh, just sw- swiftly passing on around there Slipping right on past one Mississippi, two Mississippi, before long you've got 60 Mississippis and you had another minute went by. Listen, we're in all of us, especially those of us that are this age and a lot of you, it's like, where did 2023 go? Seems like just what? A few weeks ago, we starting out in January. A few weeks ago, you know, my mind still tells me I'm about 50. Yeah, even though I had a 66th birthday the other day on Friday. Yeah, but my mind, you know, my mind and my spirit that are eternal beings, I shared that with someone this morning, I think. Listen, it was that you, brother? Listen, it, it, it's, it's an eternal, so it doesn't know a clock. Your spirit and mind does not know a clock. Our physical body knows a clock. Our, we, our eyes see a clock, and yet there's a part of us that realizes, hey, God, God made me to live forever, but not in this body. Thank God. Amen. Amen. But while I'm living in this body, God made time for us. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you'll find out that everything had to do with the time. When first day come, morning and evening, you know what he did? He established time with the very first creation, morning and evening. A Jewish Bible will tell you that there's a 12-hour day and a 12-hour night. God was establishing something that was going to be eternal for this earth. Now this earth's going to pass away and things are going to be different in the eternity, okay, during the millennium and then from there on. But for now, we're living on a time schedule that God made for us. We're living in a time frame that God wants us to make good use of. And during this present time that while we're doing this and living this life, we need to find out what where our time slots are. Well, sometimes we have to just study on it. Sometimes you've got to, what we would say, make time. And there are those of you in this room today would tell me, now, Brother Dale, I have a hard time finding time to read my Bible. I have a hard time finding time to study the way I should. I have a hard time finding time to call my parents or to call my children or to do the things that I really know in my heart that I should be trying to accomplish. Probably every one of us in the room that's an adult would tell me this, the very same thing. Oh, I have people tell me, well, I can't come to church because that's the only time that I have to do my laundry. Or that's the only time that I have to go buy my groceries. It's the only time that I can be at home and do my own thing. And you know what they're saying? They're saying that they've got their whole time frame messed up. They don't understand the purpose of time in their life. And, they're, and they got things out of place. So one of the things that all of us need to do at the end of this year, now that we're beginning a new year, is to look and establish in our heart the truth or not, whether I have my time slots in correct order. And if I don't, it's something that I should pray about with God because God is the God of routine. Let me tell you, God does things. He does things with a purpose. He does things because He has a plan and He wants you and I to be the same way. If we have anything in our life that's, that's been left undone, okay, you know what? You ain't got much time to get it done if you want to finish it this year. And I, I know in my heart that there are those of us in this room who, and when it comes to 
our feelings. You know, I teach you to walk by faith and not by sight, but we're so governed and manipulated by our feelings that sometimes that's the reason why that our time is all messed up and we, and we work more than we should work and sometimes we sleep more than we should sleep and sometimes we eat more than we should eat and sometimes we rest more than we should rest and sometimes we play more than what we should play and sometimes we're doing all kinds of things more than what we should because we're not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit that indwells down in our heart. And when I take a crucial time away from the crucial things in my life to do things that are not crucial, then what I'm doing is I'm messing up my time. I'm messing up my life. I'm not being obedient to God whom I have chosen to serve because like the song that Kelly sang a while ago, and listen, we, used, we sang that song. I stood on stage many times in five years and sang back up on that song. I sang the low part, so low that nobody could hear me over the others. Amen. Because you guys already know, I was the person who carried those heavy speakers in and set them up on top of the stands because they weighed about 120 pounds. So I was very useful, all right? But I was more useful off the stage than I was on the stage. But I, we sang that song. We got it down in our spirit. People sometimes, I think, wonder why is Brother Dale and Sister Susan like they are. And one of the reasons that we are is because we watch people who had a consistent uh, consistency about them and I'll never forget, I shared this this morning on, uh, our, on our broadcast, and then we accidentally deleted it, so most of you didn't hear it unless you were there. But you know what? Peg McCamey made a statement one time. We were listening to her at Fredericktown up on stage, and she said, listen, you're going you're gonna to see me who I am because I'm not going to change for you. I'm going to be Peg McCamey. Like me or don't like me, you're going to talk about me one way or the other, so I'm just going to be me. And when she would sing, you knew you were getting the real thing. What God wants all of us to be is the real thing. And when we're the real thing, it's when we make time for God, we do what God wants, and we put God in our time slots no matter what it is. There, there are things people have got to learn. Listen, God, God likes to mow the yard. God likes to mow the yard. God likes to wash dishes. God likes to make the bed. God likes to take trips. God likes to do the things that you do, and He wants to be included in that so that now, while you're occupying this time slot, you've got God in this slot. And when you've got God in any slot in your life, it just got better. Amen? It just got good because God was there. And you know what happens when God's in that and it gets good? Then all of a sudden you don't regret having to mow the yard. And you don't regret having to wash the dishes. And you don't regret having to go somewhere or do something. You just do it because you know God's going to be with you in it. And when God's with you in it, let me tell you, you enjoy doing that. And life gets much better. Amen. So just heed the words of Solomon and Ecclesiastes and understand, hey, you know what? There's... There is that time for everything. So next time you think, well, I don't have time for that. Next time you hear those words come out of your mouth, and you know, well, I don't have time to go there. I don't have time to call them. I don't have time to visit. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time. Let me tell you, you do have time. So you just said something. You're sowing a seed in your life that's stealing your time. And now the truth is, you've only got an allotment of it. You've only got an allotment. When the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, that means you have an appointment with death, and when death comes, your time clock ended. Your life, physical life will be over. Eternity will begin. You'll not go back and do anything. Solomon also said in a later chapter in Ecclesiastes, all that your hands find to do in this life, do it, because your days are numbered. Our time is numbered. So if I'm not doing what I need to do now, then that's the thing that I need to change so that I'm making better use of my time. And you know what? Some of us don't have near as much time as some of you. And we may not have as much time as what we think we have because we don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. There were two men who passed away in Bernie this weekend. And you know what? They probably thought they had more time. They probably did. And we think, we'd like to think we've got a lot of time. I'd like to think that all of us have time. I'd like to think that our world will get better, that my kids can grow up, my grandkids can go up and grow up in a better world. Do uh, you know what? But if it ain't going to happen, then I'm okay with time ending. 
I'm okay with God putting a stop to it. I'm okay with the trumpet sounds because when the trumpet sounds, time is over for the world, whether they realize it or not. And the seven years that follows the trumpet is not going to be anything good that takes place in it. Just know that. Amen? Now, so in Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to go ahead and read those three verses uh, just because you need to hear this one. It says this, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not understanding, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? That you redeem the time. Now, that word time again meant what? It meant opportunities. Every day of our life, God grants us opportunities. We get up in the morning and some of us will say, well, God's, I'm still above the earth, not beneath it, right? You know, we're glad to be alive. I've heard Sammy pray that prayer uh, many times in our home and church. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up. You know what that says? That God gave me another day. When God gave me another day and you, He gave us another 24 hours. So if i got 24 hours, what am I supposed to accomplish in this 24 hours? What are the opportunities that I have? Well, you know what? Uh, every day, no matter who you are, every day is filled with opportunities. No telling how many, if God's keeping account of missed opportunities in our life, I think the missed opportunities are going to outweigh the, the opportunities we took advantage of. I, I would be afraid to say, because I know in my heart that we have missed opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. You've got a, a spouse, a man or a woman in your life that you love, that God put into your life, if you don't tell them that you love them every day, you missed an opportunity to share the love of God that God gave you when he gave you a spouse. You got children, grandchildren, friends, family. Listen, there's opportunities galore. We go out into our world and people everywhere we look are lost. People everywhere we look are struggling. People are sick. People are doing without. People don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't know how they're going to get by. They don't know how they're going to pay their bills. Listen, every day is full of opportunities if we got our eyes open and if we recognize, hey God, you know what? What opportunity is it today that you want me to take advantage of? He said there to walk uh, circumstantially. That's a circumspectly. That's a hard word from Brother Dale. Not, not as fools. Listen, you know what? It's foolish for us not to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. It's foolish for us not to be good to people and make friends with people so that they laugh at you, smile at you. They, they're glad to serve you, whether they're at Randall's or wherever it might be. Listen, you know what? We pull up there. You know what you do? I don't know what you do. What do I do? I come in. Why do I come in? I want to see everybody. I want to talk to everybody. I want to make sure they're okay. I don't want to miss an opportunity to tell them that I love them. I don't want to miss an opportunity to smile and to receive a smile. If you come in and you're not smiling, I'm liable to try to do something to make you smile. Elise come in earlier today and I had to force a smile out of her. I don't know what her parents said when she let her out, but it must not have been too good. She's back there and can't hear me, so she don't know I'm talking about her. Amen. So she's a sweet kid. We've learned to love her. We've taken time to learn her. We've taken the opportunities that God granted us to spend some time with her so that we could get to know her, so that we could express love to her, to make friends with her. And you know what? When you don't come to church, I can't get to know you. We, if we don't have no time together, I have no opportunity to get to know you, to know something about you so I know how to pray for you, know what you might be in need of, to know how I might help you. Amen? We've got to take advantage. That's what he said. Redeeming the time. That means to take advantage of every opportunity. Sometimes I think, you know, maybe I ought to just uh, call two or three of you aside and not let you leave church after 12, you know, so that we can spend a little bit of time together because I might want to know your name. I might want to know where you live. I might want to know what your hobbies are. I might want to know if you're married, got kids, you know. I may want to know. Why would I want to know? Because I want to get acquainted with you. I want us to be friends. I want to be able to uh, seize an opportunity to be a help to somebody if necessary. See, there are so many different ways. So many. You know what? There are three shoulds, I call them, of time. 
One of them is, my steps should be guided by God. That's what he was saying. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And uh, Solomon said in Proverbs that he would guide the steps of the righteous. So my steps should be guided. Should they not? If my steps are guided, then I'm redeeming some time. I'm taking, uh, I'm going to be in a place where the opportunities are going to be there. I'm going to be where an opportunity is. Smith Wigglesworth, if you've ever read after him, he was a great preacher of God back a hundred years ago. And he had it in his heart. He wanted to win a soul to the Lord every day. He'd get up in the morning, and the first thing he'd do is start praying. He'd say, God, I, I want to I uh, be aware of the individual you're working on so that I can lead him to the Lord. Very few days in that man's life, he didn't win somebody to the Lord because he seized. He grabbed hold of the opportunity that God presented unto him to present the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen, we live in a, in a tough world where people are hurting and they want to hear good news. They want people to love them. They want people to smile. They want people to laugh. They want people to care. They want people to share with them because they've got things that need shared and they need somebody to care and they're, they're down to that place where they have so little hope and they're not sure what they're going to do and God's still sitting on the throne and he's able to do whatever that's needed to be done in anybody's life if somebody will take some initiative and seize the opportunity of the hour. But we've got to seize it. I don't care where you work. If you work at Nestle, there's people there that's lost. If you work at WW, there's people there that's lost. If you sell cars for a living, listen, you have people come in who's lost. It doesn't matter. Wherever that we go, there's people that are lost. It's an opportunity to share Jesus. And there ain't anything that changes anybody's life like Jesus can change a life. Just like he changed mine and yours. You know what the other should is? It's the, I should do what God told me to do. If I'm redeeming my time, seizing the opportunities, then I should do what God told me to do. How many times have we thought about, well, I should have went there. I should have invited them to the lunch. I should have called. I should have went by the hospital while I said, Kate. I should have. Amen. Should. Because you should have, you should have done it the first time. That's right. Yeah. And you know what the other should is? I should have done better. Is there any one of us in this room who would say, you know what? I did my best 2023. Man, I gave it my all. I'm telling you, I didn't leave anything undone. I didn't miss any. Op no, we're all guilty. We should have done better. We should have let God guide our steps. We should have done what we know knew to do, but we just didn't do it. You know what that means? That means that there were failures in our life. Here's what I do with failure. I repent. God, I realize that I could have done more. I should have done more. I would have done more if I had redeemed the opportunities that I had. Failures, not... Listen, you know what God wants to do with failure? He wants to change it. He can turn failure into success. Did you know that? Because God can do anything. So if we'll recognize that we had failure, all right. Maybe I failed some of you in our church last year. Who knows? If I did, you come tell me. If I failed to be good to you, if I failed to love you, if I failed to pray for you, if I failed you in any way, if we did, then we need to know because God can use any situation that's bad, a failure, and turn it to good and make a change in it. 2024 can be a year where we recoup our losses, where we regain our traction, where we restructure our lives because we renewed it in Him because we repented of our failures. If I didn't seize the time and use it wisely, then I had failure. If there were opportunities that just snuck by, right by me, listen, then, then we're out. We're just out. Today, you know what? There are a lot of people. It's December 31st, their last Sunday of the year. And we have people that's not here. And every church that I know of will have people that wasn't there. And you know what people did? They, they didn't make good use of their time, probably. Yeah, Stan, you was late, by the way. Why? Because I didn't come to this morning. I had to go to church. I had to take over my life. You brought me here. 
He told you to come, didn't he? <laughs> Everybody needs to say the same thing. Well, do you realize that time is a gift? Think about it. Time is a gift. It's one of the best gifts that we have. The opportunities that come in our life, they're gifts. They come from God, so it's got to be good. So yeah, amen. Thank the Lord. You know what? The truth, the truth is God uses our time and opportunities to convert bad stuff into good. The failures, the wasted part of our lives. How many of you lay down at night and you think, gosh, I didn't accomplish anything today? Did you ever have a wasted day? Does it make you feel good to have a wasted day? No, it does not. It's one of the worst feelings that I have is just to sit down at night, fix and go to sleep, and it's like, I wasted this whole day. This whole week has been a waste. Yeah, I have too. It's not a good feeling. It's not what God wants for his children. It's not what the kingdom needs. What it needs is people who lay down at night, you and I, who think, you know what, God, it may not have been the best day of my life, but I feel good about having done this. I feel good about having been to the hospital to see Casey, and she did get to come home this week. I feel good about the time that I prayed. I feel good about being able to, whatever that it was. God wants us to feel good about our day, our life. You want to sleep better at night? Go to bed feeling good about your day. You want to wake up refreshed? Feel good about the day that you just spent, about the time that was useful and not useless. Because when time's not useful, then it becomes useless. And we don't none want that. You and I don't either. And here's the good part of that. When God takes waste, when he takes failure, and he makes good from it, you know what? It glorifies God. And if anything that our lives need to do or are supposed to do, it's supposed to bring glory to our Father that's in heaven. The good things that God can do with us brings glory to God. But if I don't allow Him to turn my failures into my successes, then He gets no glory. None whatsoever. If God doesn't get any glory from our lives, what do you say about the rocks? said the rocks would cry out. If we don't worship him, somebody's going to. If our life doesn't bring glory and worship to him, listen, we're, we're struggling. That's all that there is to it. You know, at the end of the year, sometimes we need to ask our question, what's been lost in my life this year? What did I lose because I failed to redeem my time? What did I lose? It can be a good question. Did I lose a friend? Did I lose a soul that could have been saved? Did I lose a contact that I needed to make? Did I lose? It's a good question for us. We don't want to go through life losing because we're not losers. We're overcomers. We're winners. We're not quitters. We're not defeated. We're more than conquerors through Him. A conqueror is one who, who uses the right amount of time to do whatever... A fight, whatever battle must be fought to accept the victory that comes in Jesus' name, we become winners. I like being on the winning side, don't you? Do you know what you have to do with time? And I'm about to get to the sermon after all that. You know what you got to do? You got to take time. Take. If you're going to be wise, if you're going to walk circumspectly, with wisdom, then you've got to take time. Because you know what? On an, in a normal life, you don't have a, a time to pray. You get up in the morning and it's like, okay, I've got to make the bed. I'm going to wash my face. I'm going to go in. I'm going to cook breakfast. I'm going to get dressed. I've got to be on the road at such a time. I've got I to gotta do this. I'm going to work this many hours. If you don't take time to pray every day, you don't pray. You, I didn't hear a single amen. I pray every day. You pray every day when you take time to pray. Some of you take time to pray in the morning. Some of you take time to pray at night. Some of you take a, a couple minutes to pray at your meal. Listen, you had to take that time because there's something else that will steal it. And I've preached that in years past. Time stealers... And everybody's got them. We've all got them in our life. 
And it will steal our time. You know what a headache will do? It'll steal your time. Sickness will steal your time. Death will steal your time. Pain will steal your time. I'm telling you, the devil's got so many things out there to steal your time. Don't let the devil steal it. You take your time. Take time to pray. I'll give you a good list this morning. Take time to pray. If you don't put God in your day, then you have a day without God. How do I put God in my day? Those that seek me early find me. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So we seek God early. When should I take time to pray? I'm telling you when you first wake up. Even if it's just this long, take time to pray. Because if you don't take it, then your wife will probably take it. Or one of your kids will take it. Or the phone will ring and it'll take your time. Or something interesting will come on the TV and it'll take your time that you should have been praying. But Because if you don't take it, then it's not yours. But it's there for the taking. There's not a day of your life that you don't have time to pray. So if you've ever spent a day in which you didn't pray, it's because you've refused to take time to do it. If you didn't pray, you didn't talk to God. If you don't talk to God, He's not much of a friend to you, is He? You know, for so many people in the world, God is an acquaintance instead of the best friend. He's an acquaintance. He met them one time. He got right, when they got right, you know, and they prayed the sinner's prayer, and they got their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and then they just went on about their business like, you know, God doesn't exist. He's on that throne somewhere. Truth is, God lives in our heart. And he wants to be more than an acquaintance because he wants to be your father. He wants you to pray. And when you pray, you listen. You know what else you got to do? You got to take time for friends and for family. And I'll tell you why. Number one, when you pray to God, he's the source of life. When you pray to your, for your friends and your family, they are the source for your happiness on earth. Is there anything that makes you happier than to see your grandbabies? How many of you went over there and cooed and awed and over Bodie this morning? How many, of you, how many of you frowned at him, stuck your tongue out at him, thought, oh, what an ugly baby? No, not a single one of you. It doesn't happen that way because you took time, all right, to enjoy something God gave you that makes you happy. And every day of our life, there are people in it, it will just take a little time God has put them there so that we can experience something, something that makes us happy. Now joy comes from the Lord, but things in this world are what we look for to get happiness from. And the best happiness there is, well, now number one is grandkids. Amen? Number two might be children. Number one is grandkids. You already know that. Babies, all babies is number three. I'm telling you, anybody who doesn't love babies has got a real problem. They need to get saved. That's all there is to it. I've changed three diapers in one day lots of times. Yeah. You missed out, Stan. That's all I can say. All right. You know what else? You've got to take time to work. Take time to work. It's the source of success. There's nothing wrong with work. Take God to work with you. You can enjoy work. God can bless you at work. God can bless your work. God can make you feel good about the job that you do. Make you want to do the best job that you possibly can. You'll impress people, find favor with God and with man, and you'll find favor in your checking account. Man that don't work shouldn't eat. Man that don't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. Take time to work. Just put God in it. Whether you work eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours. God says seven days, thou, six days thou shalt labor. That would be a what? Six, twelve hour day. Seventy-two hours. You work seventy-two hours, you will enjoy some things that you didn't enjoy before. You'll, you'll enjoy going home at night. You'll enjoy eating a, a good meal. You'll enjoy spending some time with your family. You'll enjoy going to bed because you're wore out. 
You'll enjoy having a job that pays well. And when you are off, you'll enjoy having extra money that you can do things with when God gives you the extra time that God will give you to spend the money that you made because you were obedient to His Word. And there's always work to be done. People said, Brother Dale, what are you going to do when you retire? Listen, I, I, this year went by so fast, I can't tell you what I did. But I know one thing, I never got bored. I never failed to have something to do. I've got work piled up that I ain't going to get done 2024, and I'm okay with that. If you feel sorry for me, come on down. I'll put you to work. Yeah. And if you need to take time to work, I'll show you how. Take time, number four. Take time to meditate. It's the source of power. Thinking on good things, God things, okay, puts words in our mouth, seeds that we sow that produce God's will. It's not all about reading the Word. It's about seeing the Word, getting it in our mind and our spirit. It's about thinking on that. That's what it means to meditate, is to think on these things, things that are good, things that are honest, things that have a good report, things that are trust. Worthy, think on these things. And then when your mouth opens up, you're not saying something stupid, something foolish, something that is unfruitful, something that's going to cause the curse to come. Now all of a sudden you're, you're saying what you meditated on came out of the Word of God and it's producing blessing and favor in your life and it has the power to change things. The churches that we grew up in never taught us to meditate on the Word of God. And yet God's Word says, meditate on them day and night, and you will find good success. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The Word of God doesn't just need to be in the white pages of a black book. It needs to be hidden in your heart. And then out of the abundance of your heart speaks. But it's got to pass through your mind to get down to your heart. So you meditate on it. The more you think about it, the more you get it. The more you get it, the more it lodges down inside where it can't be removed. Now you're making huge deposits of the Word of God down into your bank. We've been preaching that message 32 years. Hope you got it by now. Okay, to meditate, you know what else? Take time to read. Take time to read. That's why the book club is going to be a good thing for all you women that like to read because I've been watching you on Facebook and some of you have been reading some stuff that will not, will not, all right, manifest God's goodwill in your life. That's an amen or an old me. It may be good reading and it may, it may put a smile on your face and it, may be, it might be all right for you to read some of that. But listen, if we're not devoted some time to God, hear that word again? If we haven't devoted some time to God to read some things that will enlighten us, that will produce knowledge, because knowledge comes is the source of knowledge, reading is. We've got bookshelves full of books. Don't ever do without something good to read, something that can change your life, something that can change the way you live. Listen, some of the smallest books in our library are some of the most powerful ones that we ever bought. It ain't all about the thickest ones. When I, when I was a child... When I was in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I read everything under the sun. I went to the library and I checked out the biggest books that they had. And I'll tell you that The Count of Monte Cristo is one of the best books you'll ever read in your whole life. Treasure Island was 1,100 and some odd pages. I read that whole thing. It was a great book. It was. But did it affect me the way that the Believer's Authority, that was about 56 pages, affected me? The little book of Charles Capps, The Tongue of Creative Force, changed my life more than those two volumes that were this thick ever did. They produced a knowledge within me that I never forgot. Teach me how. Teach me why. Teach me where. Teaches me who. Points me to God. Yeah, take time to read. I don't care if it's just a page a day. Listen, two pages a day. Start reading. Spend a little time reading. Something good. And it, read your Bible for sure. Do you know what? You'll read, if you read too much of your Bible, it all jumbles together. It all jumbles together. You can read something, meditate on that, think on that. Then you'll pick up something God puts in your life and it will confirm what you read out of the Bible. 
And you'll see an application to that truth and you'll think that works, that works. By the mouth of two witnesses, it's confirmed. It gets down in your spirit. Next time you're praying, you're praying the Word. And when you pray the Word, you're putting angels to work. God's listening and the devil starts trembling and you become trouble. Trouble, trouble to the devil. And if you don't, you never trouble the devil. Take time to laugh. Amen. You guys get to laugh at me at least once every week. I try my best to just be honest. And when I'm honest, you have something to laugh about. And honestly, listen, laughter is good. It doeth good like a medicine. It is the source of healing in our life. You can be mad at me, and if I can make you laugh at me, you'll forget about being mad, and I can heal a relationship with laughter. I can heal my body with laughter. I can heal a lot of things. It's the source of healing. Laughter is. Listen, there's a guy, there's a, he's a Korean born in America. Paul, what's his last name? Cho? Henry. Henry. If you haven't heard Henry Cho, listen to Henry Cho. He'll make you laugh. It's clean. Henry, he's clean, right? And then there's that crazy one. Okay, he's going to be out Joplin next year. Uh, Steve Hawkins. Listen, Hawkins will make you laugh till you cry. All right? And you know what? Some of you need to laugh till you cry. You need to shed some tears. You need to get some refreshing and some cleansing. Laughter is good. Hang around with some people who make you laugh. Hang around with Darren. Darren will come up with something you can't help but laugh. Amen? Darren, he's like a physician of the best kind. He doesn't charge you a, a fee for coming to see him. And he won't prescribe something you got to go to the drugstore for. Because he'll make you laugh. We need more people who can make us laugh. I could tell a joke every week, but Susan don't like for me to tell jokes. Did you hear? She says, don't do it. And I don't have to because you always laugh at me anyway. We got Darren, you don't need me. He's, he's got the gift. It's a gift. I'm telling you, it's a gift. Yeah, praise God. I wish everybody would stimulate their gifts. I, yeah, I could say one thing and he could say the same thing and you'd laugh at him and you'd look at me like I was strange. But I am strange, so it's okay. All right, what was number six? That was six. Number seven, take time to dream. Dreams are the source of hope. When I dream about, listen, do I need to dream about empty seats? No, you dream about full seats. Do we dream about empty altars? No, we dream about full altars. Do we dream about an empty baptistry? No, dream about a full baptistry. Don't dream about an empty bank account. Dream about a full bank account. Don't dream about a wore out car that breaks down. Dream about something that God wants to give you to get you where you need to be. Have hope. Dream so that your hopes will grow. When you and again, remember when you put God in the right slot. So if God, if you take time to dream and God's in it, let me tell you, hope comes because that's the source. Know that, Amen. Number eight, I'm trying to close. <laughs> Take time to play. Take time to play. I, I think that's the worst thing about getting older is that it seems like we have less time to play than what we used to. And so we're always thinking about how we used to play. Okay? Am I the only one in the room that goes there? Okay, Red Rover, Red Rover. Anybody ever play Red Rover? How many of you don't know what that means? They don't know. Look, I, I saw some hands. Didn't know what that meant. Never played Red Rover, Red Rover? Yeah. Okay. Did you ever catch lightning bugs in a jar? Yeah. Don't even find them anymore. These farmers that killed them all. <laughs> Brother Al, we're not holding that against you. Okay. <laughs> you don't see very many. You all remember that. What do we call them? Three words. Good old days. What was, why do we call them the good old days? Because we played. And they brought joy into our life. Play and tag. Huh. 
climbing in Grandpa's barn until he'd catch us, and then he'd run us off. He'd go back in the house, and we'd run right back out there. He had that rope hung down from the middle. Hey, he's piled up on both sides. I'm telling you, we played pirates in there. We had, that was a blast. If we could go back to any time of our life, you know where we'd go back to? When we played and had fun. Grandma. Hey, Grandma and Grandpa's mostly. Yes. Take time to play. You're not too old to play. Did you get that? You're not too old to play. Just don't start about 8 o'clock at night, though. <laughs> if we're going to play, we're going to have to get started after lunch. Can I have an amen on that one? They come to my house to play and I'm going to bed. Lock up when you leave. Lock up when you leave. And they've done that a few times. And I go to bed because I don't want to interrupt them snoring. You know? It is okay. I think we ought to have a play day this winter. Church, how about that? I'm ready for a good old-fashioned Monopoly game. The kind that takes six hours and I win. But now i got to be banker. <laughs> okay? Let's just establish that. I'm banker and I get the car. Let it go. And you know what most important of all? Most important one of all is take time to love. Take time to love. Love is an action word. But when I take time to love, I do it through my actions. I do it by treating people the way that God wants me to treat them. I do it by hugging their necks. Somebody said, you hug everybody, don't you? I, yeah. I've kissed a few men, you know. I may have kissed you a time or two. I promise you it was on the cheek. Take time to love. One of the best ways that you can love people is to shut your mouth and open your ears. People need a sounding board. People need to know that you care about them. And when you listen, it proves that you love them. So listen. But if you don't take time to love people, you've got to have time for people. Now, Susan and I, we're guilty, so we're going to just own up to that. We hardly ever go to Walmart. You know why? Because you can't get out there. Because you see everybody you know. And I'm going to talk to everybody I know. And sometimes we have this excuse that we ain't got time now to talk to everybody. Oh, me is right. And you know what? It may be the best witness place we've got. Seems like we run into more people there than we do anywhere else. Of course, last night we was at Harps and everybody on every aisle, somebody we knew. And we'll say, oh, we got to get out of here. What do we really got to get out of here? When all we got is what? How many of you ever heard me say that? All we have is time. That's all we have. It don't cost you nothing. It's a gift from God. That's all we have is time. But we have to take that time and be wise with it and see the opportunity that's there an opportunity to pray, an opportunity to encourage someone, an opportunity to give somebody a present, a gift, whatever opportunity that that particular time has, you have to take it. And you know what we need to do? One thing we need to remember, and I'll quit, Jesus took time for you. When he was hanging on that cross, I'm telling you, he could have called 10,000 times 10,000 angels. And they'd have pulled him off of there and took him straight home. No, he took time out. He took time for you and me. He did it for me. He did it for you. So if he can take time for us, can we not take time for him? Can we not? Should we not? Will we not? Let's take time for Jesus. Let's stand. Let's give God some glory. Can we do that? All right, let's be blessed. Listen up, children. As you approach each day your battles, don't let your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be afraid. For the Lord our God is he that goes with us to fight for us against all of our enemies to keep us safe. 
Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you his peace. Amen. Shake hands with your neighbor.